I'm a therapist. I'm a sophomore. A sheet metal mechanic at Tinker. I'm a freshman. I'm a veteran. I'm an airline employee. I'm a and they senior. seem like I have it all together. At first glance, some might even say things are going pretty well for me. But they, they don't, don't know. know the facts. But they don't know the facts. The facts that are that I've been broken. I've been messed up. I was sick. I was what some would call damaged goods. On March 25th, 1995, I was diagnosed with HIV and AIDS. I would plan my life around the next drink, and that next drink would lead to 10, which would then lead to blackouts, broken promises, and failed relationships. And I did all kinds of things that I'm ashamed of, drugs, marijuana, coke, LSD. I was in a rollover car accident and close to the brink of death. I found myself in an abusive relationship, which resulted in fear every day of my life. I tried to handle everything by myself, but I failed. Those are the facts. Those are the facts. Those are the facts. But the truth is, God saves. God restores. God heals. He has taken the broken pieces of our lives and repurposes them to be something new. Something whole. Something pure. Something genuine. He makes life worth living. He healed my broken heart. He healed me in May of 2009. He healed me of my cancer. He has brought me through so much in my life. He set me free from my alcohol addiction. He restored my faith in marriage and gave me a new marriage. He healed me, he protected me, and he turned me into a walking miracle. He brought me out of that relationship and helped me see my self-worth and helped me see how I am through his eyes. Now I am free. Now I'm free. Now I am free. Now I am free. Now I am complete. Now I am complete. Now I am complete. I'm complete. God takes the broken pieces of our lives. The broken pieces of my life and remade them into something beautiful. My life has been repurposed for His plan. And I have been repurposed for the glory of God. I have been repurposed for the glory of God.
guys can do better than that. I said good morning. Happy Easter. We're glad you're here. Help us give praise to the King of Kings today. Let's sing. Cornerstone, how's everybody doing on Easter Sunday? Okay, so everybody say three. So guess what happened in three days? The tomb was empty, amen? Okay, so on the count of three, I need everybody to say woot woot with me because the tomb was empty. Ready for this? Count of three. One, two, three. Woot woot. That's right. Hey, if you're our guest today, thanks for attending service with us. After service, if you would, for just a moment, stop at the information center outside. We've got a gift for you. But before we do anything, we need to have an informal survey real quick. How many of you guys, when you woke up this morning, if you were to find an Easter basket beside your bed, would rather have the following? Would you rather have truffles in it? Or would you rather have a Cadbury cream egg? Now, I know this is a difficult decision. So, by sound of applause, who would rather have Lindor truffles in there? Mm. All right. Now, let's do Cadbury egg. I got to say that most of you are truffle people. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So, if you would, if you love truffles more than anybody else in this building, come find me after service. And this bag of truffles is yours. Hey, if you would, before we move on, if you would turn around and say hi to 67 people, and we're going to keep worshiping.
stand to save your love the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse of Christ because he rose from the dead that we have this hope we have this peace we have this strength that the world cannot take away from us amen father we worship you we give you everything this morning we lay it down at your feet Yes. 
something that makes me white as snow. pray with me, church. Father, we thank you for your blood. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the cross. Jesus, you are good. You are so good. And we give you praise. Lord, I've said it before, but Lord, if you never did another thing for me, you've already done enough to warrant an eternity of worship, an eternity of service, God. So that's what I want to do right now. I want to lay everything down at your feet every struggle, every care I might be facing. Lord, I lay it down before you right now. And I pray you'll open up my heart to receive from you in Jesus' name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. You can be seated. You know, I had this thought while we were worshiping God. Here it is. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus walked on this planet Earth. And 2,000 years later, he's still packing out the house. Amen? Something about that name, that man, Jesus. And uh, we are so blessed today to be able to come together and honor his name and celebrate his story and maybe in a creative way. And, and uh, man, the, the worship team, I mean, I just got to give some shout outs this morning. The worship team, our creative arts team, uh, our first impression, our men's ministry. There's a whole lot of people that did a whole lot of work around here just getting us to where we are today. Can we just give a big hand for all those people that have worked so hard? We value them and appreciate them so very, very much. Uh, several months ago, when our creative team came to me and they said, here's the idea we have for Easter. It's, it's, it's repurposed. Can you work with that? And uh, I thought about that for just a moment, and I remember thinking, that's the gospel. That is the gospel message of God taking a life and repurposing that life for a greater cause. See, God takes broken lives and, and, and lives that, that are without purpose or have lost their meaning, and then he repurposes them for a greater cause. See, here it is. To repurpose something is to take something that is broken or used up and then remake it for a better purpose. And let me, let me kind of show you an idea of what I'm talking about. Any, any fans of Pinterest in the house? Any people that follow Pinterest? All right, check this out. You're going to appreciate uh, what it means to repurpose some things. Here's just some things up there. And, and these are things that at one time had a purpose, but maybe, uh, maybe they were wore out. Maybe they were used up. But somebody found them and said, you know what? We can still use that. We're going to take that thing, and we're going to give it a new meaning. We're going to give it a creative meaning. We're going to put a wow factor in it, whether it's a, a library piano or a, you know, a tailgate that's been turned into a bench, and everything that you see up here. Somebody was creative, and they took something that other people saw as junk, maybe saw as worthless, and they said, I can make something creative out of that. That is exactly what God did with us when he repurposed our life. Then he made something incredible out of our lives and even out of the mistakes that we made sometimes. 
In fact, this entire platform, this stage and, and this pulpit has been made uh, out, of, out of scrap wood. It was thrown away, it was scrap piled, and, and yet some very creative people took it and they repurposed it, and now today it is giving glory to God. And that's what we're all about, and that's what God is all about. See, here's my message in a soundbite or, or in a headline, is that God takes broken lives and he rearranges them, he remakes them, he refashions them for his greater purpose. And uh, let me go ahead and give you a definition. I'm going to put this up on the screen because this is really the, the heartbeat of what we're saying today is that God gets glory by taking lives that feel useless or even seem useless and then repurposing those lives by empowering them with the life of Christ. And the last half of that statement is really the key of what God does, that he repurposes them with the life of Christ, and that's Easter. See, Jesus makes the difference. Jesus adds purpose to your life. And even though your life may be broken on the outside, God starts from the inside and works from the inside out. Yet he takes that broken physical life. He doesn't repurpose you on the inside. He gives you a whole new beginning on the inside. But he takes that broken life and maybe the circumstances of your life and he repurposes those things for a greater cause. Listen, every one of us here have a story. Every one of us here have a past. But God can use that past and, and take advantage of it. And I don't, I'm going to share this. I don't think the person would mind at all. I actually had somebody left the first service, and they said, i got to talk to you for just a moment. I said, do you really mean that everybody's welcome here? Because I've been places where I wasn't welcome. Am I welcome here? How many know that God's house is open to everybody? Amen? That we welcome people into the presence of God. See, Jesus, in his earthly ministry, was always seeking out damaged goods in order to repurpose their lives. And I'll give you some examples from the New Testament. And, and one was the woman at the well. If you remember that story, Jesus came through town on purpose looking for this woman. And he found this woman and he began to talk to her about her life. He began to reveal to her the brokenness of her life. And he said, you've already had five marriages and the person you're married to now isn't your husband. And she said, how do you know these things? And then the light came on and she said, you must be the one that we've heard about. You must be the Savior. You must be Jesus. And he loved on her and he didn't condemn her for her past, but because he loved her where she was, she left and went home to her village. And she said, there's a man that told me everything about my life. You've got to come hear him. And he repurposed her life and gave her meaning. She became an evangelist. And the Bible says her whole town turned out and believed on Jesus. Mary Magdalene, she was a prostitute before she met Jesus. But here's a picture of a life that was changed and repurposed. In fact, here's such an incredible story about her life that when she met Jesus and she worshipped Jesus, she became, she became the King David of the New Testament. She was the worshiper of the New Testament, so much to the fact that Jesus said this. He said, wherever you preach my message, wherever you tell my story, you tell her story, the story of a changed life and how she went from a, uh, uh, fr fr from a prostitute to a praiser, how she entered in a life of worship because he repurposed her and changed her life. Simon Peter, I mean, this guy had issues. And, and here's, here's Peter's thing is that Peter had a huge passion for himself. But when God dealt with him and Jesus dealt with his life, that, that he turned his life around and he began to care more about others and care more about Jesus than he did his own life. Even to the point that when he died, he said, crucify me upside down. It was a request. He said, because I am not worthy to hang on the cross the way my Savior hung on the cross. And upon his request, he was crucified upside down. And of course, Saul, who later became Paul and wrote the majority of the New Testament because he had this powerful experience with Christ. And so I understand this morning that, that maybe you've got some things in your life that aren't right or some things in, in your past. Maybe your past is painful. Maybe your past is shameful. Maybe there's pain in your past. And, and I get that. I really do. But here's the truth. It ain't over till it's over. Amen? 
you haven't come to the end of the movie and you never get up and you never leave a movie until the end because there's always some sort of plot twist and, uh, and some sort of alternate ending that you don't want to leave until the movie is over. And when God is sitting in the director's chair, I promise you, he's going to make sure that your life and your story has a happy ending in it. Let me tell you two truths, two very important truths about your future. Number one is this, God has a plan for your life, and it's good. Jeremiah 29, 11, and this is from the 26th translation, says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Look at that word hope for just a moment. How many of you realize this morning you can't live life without hope? If you take hope out of the equation and you take hope out of someone's life, that life becomes too heavy and too burdensome. It is too hard to go through life without hope. It makes life miserable, painful, and unbearable. And someone made this statement, and I wholeheartedly agree with this statement, that they said that hopelessness is the undertaker's best friend. Does anybody know what I mean by that? What it means is this, that if you don't have hope in your life, if you can't see your way out, if you never have a vision of your life getting better, then your life is as good as over. If you don't see a way out and a better life, you'll give up. But God wants to give you hope this morning by repurposing your life for a greater cause. And I don't know all the details, and I don't know all the intricate details of your life, but I can tell you part of our purpose on this earth is to know Him. I mean, that's the most important thing, is that we know Him and experience Him. And then when we know Him, we make Him known to others whether it's through our lifestyle or through our words or whatever. That's our purpose. There's no greater meaning. God puts us here before he puts us into eternity. And we're here for a reason that we might know him. Let me ask another question. How many of you here have ever failed in life? The rest of you need to be here for the brand new series. Starts next week called Liars our friars in the lake of fire. <laughs> Do you just feel the love out of that message? Amen. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I really am starting a new series next week, and this is a quick infomercial. We're starting a brand new three-part series next week entitled, What Happens When I Die? And I'm going to share with you some very, uh, very uh, interesting things. So the Bible has a lot to say about life after life. And I'm going to show you what happens when you die suddenly, maybe in an accident or drop dead of a heart attack. I'm going to show you what happens when you die that way. I'm going to show you what happens when you die on your deathbed and you, and you lay there and you linger there and maybe you have time to cross over. And I'm going to show you how to think outside the grave, so to speak. And there's a lot of things that God's going to reveal to us. But let's get back to this that we're talking about this morning. This thing called failure, this thing that all of us face. See, here's what we have to accept. We have to accept the fact that we're human. Every one of us. And that means the possibility of us making a mistake are somewhere around the 100% mark. Simply saying that all of us are going to fail and all of us are going to make mistakes. And what happens, though, is that when we fail, we have this tendency to relive that moment, to relive that mistake. And we think about it over and over and over in our lives. And we nurse it and we rehearse it. And that's not a good thing. Because nursing and rehearsing that mistake tends to paralyze us. And it paralyzes us with fear or with the fear of hopelessness. And one of Satan's greatest tools that he uses to control our lives is to take away hope from our life. To think that we'll never see a greater future or a better tomorrow. But if anyone has ever told you, hey, there's no hope, don't believe them. God loves taking people with messed up situations and circumstances. I remember reading through the Old Testament, some of these great characters, David, David was an adulterer. Moses was a murderer. Noah was a drunk. Jonah was a coward. Rahab was a harlot. She was a prostitute. And God took every one of them and he repurposed their lives where they become amazing men and women of God. 
And I don't know where you are or what you are facing or what you're going through, but if you will simply give it to God, God will take it and God will use your life and use your story and use your past for his glory. Because that's how awesome he is. Second thing that the Bible teaches us about our future and about uh, our destiny is that, number two, I get to choose my own destiny. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 15 says, I set before you today life and prosperity or death and destruction. Choose whichever one you want. But I would suggest you choose life. Everyone say the word choose. That's a powerful word. That's an incredible gift that God has given us, the ability to choose the life that we want. And the reason that I bring that up is that because you're going to live your life one or two ways. You'll either live your life by chance or by choice. And if you live your life by chance, that means that you just have, have accepted the fact that I'm an innocent bystander. I have no control over my life. I just have to watch what happens to my life and what comes my way, and I have no say about it. But God says to choose this day whom you will serve. God says to choose life or death, prosperity or poverty. You choose those things. And so when I get to choose, I, then I can choose the type of life that God wants me to have. See, God wants me to have this XXL, this extra, extra large life. I don't know how it was when, when you were a kid. Maybe as a kid growing up that your parents, when they bought you new clothes, they bought them a little bit big because they wanted you to grow into them. You know, because you go through these spurts and you just outgrow everything so fast. I, I wore, I wore hand-me-downs until I was 13. I got so tired of wearing my sister's stuff, I'm telling you. <laughs> I got beat up a lot in school. But you know, you, you buy your clothes a little bit. What are you laughing at, Lee? You still, never mind. Everybody. <laughs> God has this extra, extra large life, and we are living this small life. We've not even grown into the large, into this large life that God wants us to have. And there's so many things that God wants us to experience. Mark 2 and verse 22, and this is from the NIV, says, And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins... And both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. And I know what you're thinking here. You're thinking, what just happened here? I mean, we were talking about my future, my destiny, and hope, and now we're talking about dead animals and wine. I mean, this, this message went from resurrection to redneck in about two seconds, but there's a reason for what I'm talking about here. What they would do in the, in the Old Testament or in the Bible days is that they would take animal skins and turn them into wine bottles or wine containers. And what Jesus is teaching here in a parable is this, is that you don't put new wine into an old wine skin. Because the, 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 in order for it to be effective as a container of wine, because when the wine begins to ferment, it becomes explosive, so to speak. And, and the wineskin has to be pliable and has to be able to expand. In order for them to work properly, they had to expand. And they couldn't contain the wine if they were not able to expand. Now, this is where it all comes together. See, almost always, anytime wine is mentioned in the Bible, it either represents the Holy Spirit or it represents prosperity. And so what God is saying is, is this. And, and I've often said that, that, that oftentimes, we don't have a money problem. We don't have a lack problem. We don't have a relationship problem. What we have is our problem is our lack of ability to think like God. See, here it is. Old minds can't hold new blessings and God can't change your life and bring you into this double XL life when you're still thinking in this small frame of mind or the small focus of your thinking when you're focused on your mistakes when you're focused on your shortcomings and your failures you tend to forget just really how big God is Tell, tell your neighbor this morning, let God stretch you so he can bless you. Just say that to the person next to you. Encourage them. Ephesians 3.20. I love this verse. I'm going to try to make this verse really, really clear today. 
It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. Now, I love that scripture, but I wanted to take on a new meaning this morning. I want you to really get it this morning. And because I'm a teacher, I'm going to illustrate this. See, that's my style. I'm, I'm a teacher, not a preacher. That just simply means I share the same stuff. I'm just more boring. <laughs> same thing, just a different boring approach. But I want to show you what I'm talking about this. So if I can have a volunteer. Jack, come up here and volunteer for me. <laughs> See, when you sign up to be the pastor's usher, that's, that's what you get. And uh, you automatically volunteer for everything. Now, Jack also, Jack also is my stunt double. <laughs> so if there's ever anything going on in the church, listen, if you ever want to tell me off, no, 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 tell him. <laughs> He'll make sure I get the message. If you ever want to just punch me in the face, whoa, hold on, punch him. And that's what I call a win-win because you're happy and I'm happy. <laughs> so thank you, Jack. God bless you. What a ministry. Well, Amen. Amen. Now, I want to show you something this morning. Jack, I want you to help me out here. I'm going to give you the end of this, and I want you to step out just a little ways. And I'm going to stop you right there, because I want you to see something. This is how most of us live our lives. Because of our limited thinking, because of our limited praying, and even oftentimes because of our limited faith, we have a certain comfort zone that we're willing to go so far or think so far, but then we put limits on our thinking and on our praying and on our faith, and we say, you know, that's about as far as I can go. But the scripture we just read is that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. See, we have all of this potential still left in here, all of this room and that he could go a long ways. I mean, he could really create some distance in here. But because we put this limitation on our life, we don't let ourselves ever reach our ability. But if we would let go and let God, there's so much more that we could be and so much more that we could do because there is a power in us. But if we're going to think old thoughts and pray old prayers and limit our life, we'll never live this extra, extra large life that God wants us to have. And yet it's not up to God. He's waiting on us. It's not up to God. He's wanting us to do the things that we can do to increase our life. Thank you, Jack. And don't forget, punch him if you want to. God won't pour new opportunities into old wineskins. God won't put new blessings into old wineskins. And you are loaded with this potential. Several years ago, our family went out after church, and, and we were sitting at an Applebee's, at Applebee's in town here, and, and my chair sat facing the window, looking into the parking lot, and right in front of me, in my field of vision, was this beautiful car. I mean, it was a, it was a brand new Ford Mustang, candy apple red. I mean, it was sweet. And I've often thought, man, what a nice car, you know, and I often thought about having a car like that. That's just, I was just admiring that car. It was so cool looking. And while I'm looking at the, this car, this sweet little old lady, this senior citizen, this seasoned saint, she comes walking and she stops right in front of the window. And i like, for crying out loud, lady, come on. And she's digging in her purse. And I can't say that. I can only think that I'm a pastor. But I'm thinking, for crying out loud, lady, move it. Come on. And she's digging in her purse. And I'm looking around her. How long is she going to stay there? She pulls out her keys and she pushes a button on her key fob. And the headlights on that Mustang go blink. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You couldn't make this stuff up. You, no way. And she gets into this car, and she slowly <laughs> starts to back it out of its parking space. And then she even slower eases into traffic down the road. And I'm thinking, there is a car that will never know its potential. There is a car that will never do what it was created to do, and all of its life is going to be limited because somebody is not thinking that you could burn rubber, baby. <laughs> a little tear just running down my cheek. I thought, man, how does God feel about us? That you are so full of potential. You are so full of amazing things that you could do. If you would just take the limitations off, if you would just think on a higher level, believe with greater faith, step out and do greater things, quit letting your past hold you back, and believe God for a great future. Out with the old, 
in with the new. But before God brings the new into your life, you've got to deal with those old thought patterns, pain in your past, whatever is there. See, you're going to have to take that brokenness in your past and that brokenness in your life, and you're going to have to bring it to God for healing. You have to lay it down for him and say, God, I give this to you. I can't carry this anymore. I don't want to carry this anymore. On November 9th, 1989, and many of us remember that day, and many of you are going to remember, we sat in our living rooms, and we watched on the news the fall of the Berlin Wall. Anybody remember that? That was kind of a big thing, and it was history in the making. And the Berlin Wall was a literal physical wall that was built right down the middle of Germany, separating East Germany from West Germany, creating two different Germanys. And on one side was communism, and on the other side was democracy. And there was this wall, both real and, and, and both political and both financial, that was right down the middle. One side was communism, the other side was freedom. One side was poverty, the other side was prosperity. And for 28 years, that wall stood there until one day it was tore down. And there was a sign that went up in its place. It was very interesting. And it read this. The tragedy of this wall is not that it was built, but that we became accustomed to it. We just got used to living life with this restraint in our life. We just got used to saying, it is what it is, and there's nothing that I can do about it. Proverbs 3 and verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. And then the book of Ecclesiastes says that there is a time and a season for everything. I love that verse of Scripture. See, Easter is a new season. It's all about a new beginning. It's all about starting over. It's when Christ showed us that there's this thing called resurrection power that'll take something that is dead and it'll bring it back to life and it'll repurpose it for a greater cause. And I want you to know that some of you this morning, this is your new season. See, the Easter message is a great halftime message. The first part of the Easter story is, is Jesus being I mean, just taking a beating. And the sins of the world are placed upon him, and everything that can happen has happened. But then it stops. But then at the halftime buzzer, it starts over. And this time, he's the risen king. This time, he comes out of the grave. And this time, he is on the winning team. This is your new season. And all of those old things from your past don't belong in your new season. I have a friend that recently built a new house, a beautiful house. And I was talking with him one day, and he said, me and the wife have to go furniture shopping. I said, man, you just built her a new house. You got to buy new furniture? And he said, yeah, here's what she said. I'm not moving that old, worn-out, broken-down stuff into my new house. And all the ladies said, amen. See, they get that. They know what that's all about. I'm entering into a new season. I'm going into a new day. I'm going into a new house. And there's some old broken down stuff that's not going with me on moving day. It's moving day, but that doesn't mean you have to move everything that's in your past into your future. Let me show you what I'm talking about. There are some things here that when it comes moving day in a new season, and this is many of you today is a new beginning. There are some things that are in our past that need to stay in our past. See, here's the interesting thing, is that there are a lot of people that have a hard time getting past their past. And the sad thing about that is that God has already dealt with your past. He's already moved on from your past. He's not interested in your past. He's only concerned about your future. And one of the things that we don't want to carry into our new season is regrets. All the couldas and shouldas and I wish I wouldas and I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I would have done that. And all of these things, they just end up their stockpiled. But so many people, when they want to go into a new season, they package that stuff up and they say, come on, I'm going to bring this with me. And you really don't move into a new season at all. There are some things that we need to leave behind us. Now, here's a very sobering revelation about you. You might want to write this down. You ain't getting any younger. 
I hate to be the one to tell you that, but you ain't getting any younger. And it's time to maximize the moment that if you're going to do anything for God, do it now. If you're going to do anything with a new life, do it now. What are you waiting for? See, you're not as young as you used to be, and you're not as young as you think you are. Now, I know I hear the crying in the back. Make your life count because all of us have wasted enough time. We've wasted too much time doing our own thing. We've wasted too much time worrying about stuff that we can't change or that's already happened. We've wasted too much time trying to get people to accept you and love you and believe in you and approve of you. Because at the end of the day, all you need is God's approval. Wasted too much time listening to your drama mama, to the deadbeat dudes in your life. It's time to pursue things that matter and that make a difference. And to move on to your new season. Deal with the failures in your life. See, there's two ways to deal with failure because we've already established that all of us are going to fail. But there's two ways to deal with failure. You can take the Humpty Dumpty approach. That is that when you fall, you can just break and shatter and all the king's horses and all the king's men, but you can't put it back together again and your life never gets any better. You just kind of wallow in that brokenness of your life. Or you can take the rubber ball approach. Now, here's the thing I love about that. When you drop a rubber ball, it bounces back up. And here's the really neat thing about that. It doesn't hit the ground and then stay there saying, well, this sucks. I mean, how awful is this? I hit the ground. I mean, the moment it hits the ground, it is coming back up. There's no need wallowing in the past. If you've made a mistake, if you need forgiveness, no need carrying that thing around. Confess it to God right then and move on with your life. You can either wallow or you can bounce back. Tell your neighbors, time to get your bounce back, baby. second thing that we need to leave in past is there are some relationships that don't belong in our new season. There are some relationships that we need to leave behind. And some of us, some of you, have wasted too much time on foolish people. In fact, here's what you need to say to the foolish people in your life. If you want to be a fool then be a fool, but I don't have time. In fact, I'm going to give you permission today. If there's someone in your life and you need to say to them, the reason I give you permission is because you know what you need to do. You just need a starting point. One, two, three, go. There may be people in your life that you need to say, if you want to be a fool, be a fool, but I'm moving on. With or without you, I'm moving on. See, many of you have given your strength to people who all they do is take and take and take, but they never give back. And negative people will drain you and rob you. They're thieves. They'll steal your energy. They'll steal your future. They'll steal your time. They don't care because they're interested in themselves. And what you need to begin to do is to pray, God, put people in my life who will make me better. Put people in my life who will challenge me, who will help me to think about others, who will help me to make a difference. So I'm giving you permission to tell all the negative people in your life, here's what you tell them, you are dismissed. You can leave now. We no longer need your services. We're moving forward. Let me, let me list for you who these people might be. Here's a list of toxic people that don't get to move into your new season. People who use you don't get to move into your new season. People who disrespect you don't need to move into your new season. People who hurt you don't need to move into your new season. People who lie to you over and over and over again don't need to move into your new season. People who smile to your face and then talk behind your back. And you know who they are. They don't need a place in your new season. People that don't care about you but pretend that they do. Don't carry them into your new season. And then thirdly, we don't need to take raw deals 
into our future. It's probably not a person sitting here that at some time or another in their life hasn't received the short end of the stick, got a bad deal. I mean, somebody took advantage of you, somebody used you and abused you, and somebody, uh, you know, just didn't treat you right, and, and, and you were maybe innocent in the thing, and you just kind of got caught up in this. You got a really bad deal. You don't need to take those raw deals into your future. See, oftentimes we get so focused on what's wrong with our lives and what went wrong in our lives that we forget about what's right with our lives. In fact, let me just say it this way. Do you realize there are people today that would love to have your life? Then say your life was perfect and, and your, your life may be really broken and disturbed right now and, and, and you, know, you, you may be the one that put fun and dysfunctional. You know, you've got all of these things going on, but there are people who would love to have your life. You say, man, you've got to be crazy. There are people who are sitting in jail today that would say, if I had your freedom and your opportunity and I could make choices, I would love to have the opportunity to choose. Even if I'm starting at the bottom rung, I would love to have the opportunity to make that choice. I didn't say your life was perfect. I'm just saying there are people that would love to sit in the seat that you're sitting in. There are people that are sitting in nursing homes that are saying, I would love to have your strength. I would love to have the ability to think clearly like you think. I would love to have an opportunity to get up and go one more time without being pushed everywhere. I would love to have the opportunity to, to embrace life and fully embrace whatever is left of it. You can't afford to move that bad attitude or that raw deal into your new future. You have to make up your mind to be blessed. See, and that's the Easter story. God repurposes our lives. No matter where we are or what we're facing or what we're going through, Easter is this, is that Jesus showed up And he said, this is what resurrection power looks like. He doesn't just rearrange the inside of us. He doesn't just repurpose. He doesn't put a Band-Aid on us. No, from the inside, God gives you a brand new created spirit. He changes your life. It's called born again. You are, you are forever changed and never the same because you encountered God. But he will take that brokenness of your life, your situation, your past, what you've gone through, and he'll use your story. I mean, you heard some of the stories at the beginning of this service of people that, 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 were, that were broken physically, that were addicted, and all, all these things going into their life. And today, they are serving God and their leaders in our church because God repurposed their past and their life. That's what Easter is. It's resurrection. It's not just Jesus getting up from the dead but it's him moving into your situation. Father, this morning, I, I pray we, we chose to present Easter this morning in a contemporary way. Because God, I, I didn't want it to be just a history lesson. I didn't want it to be just an historical event. I didn't want it to just be a recounting of everything that Jesus did. Although that is incredibly precious and wonderful and amazing. And God, I'll, I'll never, I never, never, never want to minimize that. But I just had a heart, and we had a heart to show people that the resurrection is personal. That the resurrection is not just that historical event. It's not just the history lesson. It's, it's not just presenting the scientific evidence and, and the overwhelming evidence that Jesus was who he was, that he died and rose again. But it's about what it means to me. And how does it affect my life? How does it help me in everyday living? A number of years ago, I, I preached an Easter message. What does the resurrection mean to me? And here it is real quick in three points. Because Jesus died for my sin, the resurrection means to me that he can take care of my past. There's nothing in my past that cannot be forgiven. Even if your past was five minutes ago when you wanted to punch Jack in the face, God forgives you for that. There's nothing in your past that God can't deal with that God hasn't already dealt with. And since I know that he can handle my past, guess what? Then I know that he can handle my present. 
that whatever I'm facing, whatever my life looks like today, that I may think is a total mess up, and God is saying, I've got this. I know where you are. I can work with this. I can take care of you. I can provide for you. I can get you through the storms of life. Then that gives me confidence to know that I can face the future because God's already in my future. What's the resurrection mean to me? It's everything. It's my past, my present, my future. Let me ask you this question this morning. What is there in your life that you become accustomed to? That you just kind of accept it and said, you know, well, it is what it is, and that's my life, that's my tag, that's my label. Maybe you become accustomed to living a life of, of lack, thinking life's never going to get better for me, and you never are going to allow yourself to live this double XL life that God wants you to live. Maybe you become accustomed to an old way of thinking. God is wanting you to move into a new season. And whatever it is, this is resurrection day. Your dream, your life, whatever it is, God wants to breathe life into it. Maybe it's a broken relationship, a broken marriage. God will breathe life into it. Maybe, maybe your mind is broken. Maybe your emotions are just so mixed up right now that you don't know up from down. God will heal those emotions in your life. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? And, and I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to leave your seat. I just, I'm going to ask you in just a moment that if this applies to you, would you simply just raise your hand and let me know that I can include you in this prayer? That if you're here this morning and, and you've never given your life to Christ, I mean for real, that you just surrendered it all and said, God, here it is. I give it to you. And you say this morning, I realize I'm never going to be happy until I cross that threshold and take that step. Or maybe you're the one that's here this morning that, that just says, you know what, I, 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 I am a Christian. I know that I am. But I've kind of taken God on my terms. And I realize today I want to give my life to him. Whichever boat you're in, whichever one applies to you, I would love to pray for you. And so if you're here this morning and, and that is you and you say, Pastor, when you pray, would you include me that I need to give my life to Christ or rededicate my life to Christ this morning? Can I see your hand right now and we'll pray together? God bless you. Hold it up high for just a moment. I'll let you put it back down. I just want to know where I'm praying. Amen. Amen. So many of you, you can put your hands down. Thank you so much for your courage. Thank you so much for your honesty. But more than that, I know when we get honest with God, He gets real with us. Now, I want to pray this prayer. Then after I pray this prayer, I want to pray another prayer for the rest of us. But every one of you that raised your hand, this is what the Bible says. That if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Man has complicated it, but Jesus said, no, it's very simple. We're going to pray this prayer, and what's going to happen, that if you pray this prayer and you believe it, it means that God is not going to put a Band-Aid on your situation. He's going to move on the inside of you and give you a new nature. He's going to put His Spirit in your spirit, and you'll never be the same. So will you say this prayer with me, whether it's prayer for the first time or rededication? In fact, we're all going to say this prayer together. Are you ready? Let's pray this prayer. Say this after me, but mean it with your heart. Dear God, today I come to you just the way that I am. God, I am sorry that I have lived my life without you, that I've run from you, but today I run to you. Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart. I believe you're the Son of God. You died for my sin. You rose from the dead. And now you offer me eternity with you. By faith, I am forgiven and I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. What a powerful time this morning.
Those of you that prayed that prayer, there's a gold celebration card on the seat back. And if you would, and I'd like to ask you to fill that out and drop it in the offering when it comes by. But let me, let me go back to tie this all together to the beginning definition. Here's what it is. And here's what I want you to walk away with this morning. God gets glory by taking lives that feel useless or even seem useless. And then repurposing those lives by empowering them with the life of Christ. Father, every one of us here, I pray that not one of us walks out of this place today. That we don't have the reminder by the Holy Spirit that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. And because of you, Jesus, my life is significant and my life has meaning. In Jesus' name, amen. What a great message, amen. Amen. We're going to take up our offering real quick. And if you need record of your, your giving, there's uh, offering envelopes in the seat back in front of you. But before we do that, I wanted to mention how Catalyst did this week on their youth garage sale. Anybody buy anything? Anybody give anything? There you go. Well, Catalyst Student Ministries raised $15,200. Yeah. Which is $1,200 more than they've ever raised before. So that's great news. A lot of kids be going on our missions trip and camp and, and also uh, like an overnight trip. So that's good. So we're going to take up our offering. And this is audience uh, participation day. So you guys ready for this? So right down here, down this aisle, you guys are going to do something. Everybody in the middle is going to do something. And then everybody on this side is going to do something. Are you, are you good so far? You, you'll get this when we get ready. Okay. So everybody over here, I need you to give me a G. That's kind of weak. First service was so much better. Give me a G. G. Much better. Okay, you guys here in the middle, give me an F. F. Okay, you guys over here, give me an o. o. All right, GFO, what does it stand for? It stands for giving for others. Everybody say others. others. That's right. How many of you guys in here would admit that you've been repurposed? in your life. We all have, right? And so when we give, the whole idea of our giving is we're giving so that others can be repurposed, that they can hear the truth of the gospel, that their lives can be changed by ministry that happens here at the church. So I encourage you guys, if you're a guest today, if you're a regular member, if you believe that giving can change others' lives, that they can be repurposed, please participate in our offering. Father, as we come before you today, I thank you for the opportunity to give. I thank you for the word we've heard about your grace and your mercy and how you change our lives through repurposing. God, as this money is given, I thank you that ministry will go forth and people, lives, marriages, kids, relationships will all be changed because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Everyone said in Jesus' name. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I'm Heather, and I want to fill you in on what's happening this week at Cornerstone. Hey, Cornerstone moms, are you looking to spend some quality time with that favorite son of yours that is in fifth grade or under? Maybe you have more than one favorite son. Bring them all. Come join us at Catalyst on Friday, April 10th at 6.30 p.m. for our mother-son dynamic duo competition. This will be an evening of competitive games, pizza, candy, prizes, and lots of laughter. Come dressed as your favorite dynamic duo, and we'll give an award for the best costume. Tickets are $10. This includes mom and son, and are available at the Connection Center or online at cornerstone.tv. It's that time of year again when we get to bless the Middale Food Pantry. Our donations go directly towards feeding families in our local community. Sunday, April 26th, please leave your groceries in a bag or sack at the bumper of your car when you come into church. Our Raymond will pick them up and will load them into our trailer. Delivery will be made the following Monday to the pantry. Now here's what we need you to bring. Rice, sugar, peanut butter, mac and cheese, ramen noodles, dry beans, and Ziploc baggies, gallon or quart size. Thank you for taking Jesus to others. Saturday, April 25th, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., our Dry Gulch campers, sponsors, and parents will be waiting to wash your car at Catalyst. This is one of our many events to raise funds to send our kids to camp in June. The car wash is free, but your generous donations are welcome. We'll also have popcorn and drinks for sale. 
If you need more information on these events or any other upcoming events, visit us online at cornerstone.tv or on social media. All right, Cornerstone, did you enjoy the service this morning? Hey, Amen. Thank you so much for coming. You are dismissed. Have a great week, and we hope to see you back here next Sunday. You're the guy.